Okay, folks, let me tell you what we're going to be doing today, and then we'll just jump right into it. Uh, bless you. Obviously, uh, for the last couple of weeks, we've been exploring software technology. Uh, last week, it's been about system software. Uh, I introduced another utility software uh, called Virtual Machines. And Virtual Machines, uh, it gave us the ability to install different operating systems inside of our own operating system. It's important that you understand that a machine can only have a single operating system or a single native operating system installed. Right, what do I mean by native? There is no pretending. It's the real operating system being installed on real hardware and that operating system is going to be, I don't know, the king of all things inside your computer. All right? Because remember, the operating system helps to create a platform for the user to use both hardware and software. You good about that? By definition, a platform is the operating system plus the CPU. You'll see why the CPU comes, uh, becomes an important role in this today when we start developing a program. Uh, so when it comes to uh, virtual machines, it gives us the ability to create sandboxes so we can try out different products without actually having to go out and buy the machine that represents that product. Case in point, as a developer, you're going to try to write your code to be more platform independent. Remember the definition of platform, right? So if you're making it platform independent, it means it can run on multiple operating systems with different processes. Well, in today's society, what devices come with different operating systems and different hardware specs that we are getting to the point where we're just throwing them away every two years? Yeah, mobile devices. And so as a developer, having virtual machines allows us to emulate what our program will behave like on those disposable devices, those portable devices, okay? So today we're gonna to get into actual programming languages. Um, you'll have to install an IDE. IDEs are short for Integrated Development Environments. The one that we're gonna be using is Small Basic. There are literally hundreds of different programming languages out there. One could argue there are as many programming languages as there are, as there are spoken languages. Uh, the reason why I choose to use Small Basic, one, it's simplistic, but two, it's more of a throwback to the original days of what Bill Gates and Paul Allen gave the world, and that was basic, correct? So I'd like to tie everything that we do in this course. In fact, today is going to be a real big throwback because we're going to go back the very first day of class when we learned how to count. And our purpose will be is to teach our computers how to convert a decimal number into binary. Because when you're a programmer, it's no different than being a teacher. You're teaching this, I don't know, box, this machine, energy, electricity, how to process data into information. It's no different than what I do for you guys. If you will consider yourself a battery, then anything that I give you, you're processing it, manipulating, and storing it up here so that later on, when you really need to use it, you know how to use it. Small basic represents what we call third gen programming languages. And that is, it's a high level programming language. That's why I like using it. It's like broken English or dirty English. And you'll see what that's like when we actually implement this IDE. But if this implies third gen, that means there must have been a second gen, as well as a first gen. First gen is the nitty gritty stuff. Those come back to the days of punch cards, where we actually had to use zeros and ones to be computer friendly. And the reason why we had first gen languages, which we call machine language, is because the computers weren't fast enough or capable enough to handle high level languages. In fact, Grace Hopper developed something that made it even more simple for programmers to write a uh, application or software to bring it down to the first gen. Every application eventually gets compiled down into first gen. Your computers only understand binary. 
right? And so in order to do that, we need this software called a compiler. An integrated development environment, like the one we're going to be using, comes with a text editor for you to write the code, a debugger for you to troubleshoot it, and third and last, a compiler that converts the high-level stuff into a simple machine language, okay? Compilers come in two forms. We'll explore one of them. I'll tell you what the other one is. So what about second gen? Second gen languages are considered assembly language. Something that I had to learn when I was in college. Never used it in my life. And it was sort of like a cross between high level and machine. You wrote what we call APA code. And it was very short and very abbreviated. Why abbreviate it and why the shortness? Because we didn't have the one terabyte storage that we have today. So we only had like 4K of RAM. So when you wrote your code, you had to make it really simple. Today we have vast amounts. In fact, our computers are so powerful, we got even better languages than third gens. Something that you guys use all the time without even knowing it. In fact, I dedicate a couple weeks for this stuff. Fourth gen languages, consider DB, database, and queries. Can you guys give me an example of where you use this? You might not realize it. What's a query? Question, yeah. Q, question. So where do you guys go to get answers to your questions? Google. Google. Yeah, you use a search engine. That little text box allows you guys to type in some keywords, and Google has a huge database of all the different websites that relate to those keywords. Another one, and we're moving more and more towards this, fifth and beyond is dealing with AI or natural language. We want to try to write code that self-adapts, that self-evolves, that uses some kind of common sense, if you will, so that when you're developing, you're not developing for all possibilities, but you're rather teaching it common sense. Like, for instance, a developer would have to take for, sorry, a programmer would have to take for sorry, account for all different possibilities. If you want to teach software pain, if you will, Pain comes in all different forms, correct? Being slapped on the face is a lot different than being punched in the head. Same body parts are being used, but inflicts different amounts of pain. Same thing with heat. But heat is interesting because you can actually feel heat before you touch fire or something that's hot, correct? And that thing that you feel should feel the same but it comes from different sources, whether it's a hot engine or a hot cooking surface, an oven, a stove, or a heater, correct? As a programmer, using a third gen language, I would have to account for all those different possibilities that would generate heat so that when I'm teaching this computer how to detect heat, they, they can associate it with this. Well, what if I teach them the concept of heat? and not what generates heat. You see the difference there? Just like if I teach you guys addition, the rules of addition, then I don't need to have you guys memorize every possible combination of one plus another number. Does that make sense? No different than back when I was teaching you guys how to count. I taught you the rules of counting so that if I change the number system, you guys can adapt, correct? Well, that's what we're getting into today. In fact, in the video that we watched on Tuesday, it began with a quote from Steve. Steve Jobs mentioned that everybody should learn how to programming program. His reason behind that is because it makes you think. Before we get into small basic, we need to make sure that we understand what we're going to teach these machines. I need to know my materials, whether it's first gen all the way up to fifth gen, if I'm going to teach it to you guys. Would you guys feel 
very confident in me if I whip out my uh, book and I start saying, oh, okay, well, the first gen language is machine, second gen language is assembly. What would happen if you guys asked me a question? Do you think I would have the answer for it? No. Are you going to learn anything from this? You're going to learn one thing. Either drop the class or never take this class again with this instructor. Correct? When somebody knows their material, they should be able to explain it clearly to you. That when you walk away with it, you either were able to acknowledge something or you learned it. Correct? Don't expect you to sit in front of a computer and say, well, I'm just going to generate some codes because I'm, uh, I'm going to make the next Facebook page. Understand what you're trying to achieve. Break it down into something so elementary that you can teach a five-year-old how to do it. This was the concept that I followed when I taught you guys how to count. This is the concept that we are going to follow now to teach these computers how to convert. So we're going to do some... Uh, markups, if you will, or mockups. We're going to break this thing down and create some flow charts and understand the systematic approach. That's what makes computers function. It's like a script. An actor doesn't jump on stage and say, look, I'm going to create a movie. What does an actor need before they can jump on stage to make the movie possible? Script. A script. Do they write the script? Most likely not. So let's go over here on this board and let's start thinking about our problem. And let's try to understand how we can do this. How can we take a number like 10? That's decimal. Oh, that was a bad number choice. About 24. Okay. And what we want to do is convert it to binary. First of all, I have to ask, where did 24 come from? Would it make sense to write our program so that all it handles is just the number 24? What should our program do? Should be flexible, correct? Any number that the user supplies the program the program should be able to convert, correct? So what do you think the very first thing our program should be doing? Let's just say it's already built with that knowledge, okay? That's what makes third-gen languages great because it's object-oriented. I'm going to tell you somebody already developed that for us. So we're only going to focus to this point. What do you think the very first thing our program should do? When you guys open up your calculator in Windows, you expect this calculator to have a couple of features. What good would a calculator be if it doesn't accept input from the user? After all, what defines a computer? I, P, O. We need to ask the user for a number. Folks, literally, think of these things as five-year-olds. Actually, as one of my uh, history uh, videos said, think of them as like retarded, uh, retarded cockroaches that have been lobotomized. So first thing is, number one, ask the user for a number. Let's replace the 24 with x. Now why did I use x? What does x represent? Where did I get this from? Yeah, algebra, right? x equals 5, or x equals 2 plus y, or something like that, correct? It will vary. I don't care what the number is. All I'm saying is the user needs to give me that number. This allows our program to have a better shelf life so that it's more useful. You run it, 
you supply it with a number, it converts it for us, correct? So whatever the results are, whatever the, sorry, not the results, whatever the input was, we're going to store it into a variable. I like using the word DEC. Because after all, the person should be entering in what? A decimal number? Because to convert a hexadecimal number to binary requires some different parts. So here I said x. x is too generic. Let's be a little bit more precise. It's a high-level language. In fact, I could spell out decimal if I want. Doesn't matter. This variable is going to represent a tiny little box in memory. Input comes in, goes to the P, correct? P contributes to three parts, the hard drive, memory, and the CPU. When the user types in whatever number they want to convert, it's going to be stored in memory, or RAM. We're going to call that little location DEC. Now in machine language, it might have been bit 01001101110. Is that very user-friendly? This is. All I'm saying is DES represents this spot in memory. The operating system knows what that means, and it'll go there and grab the data. Now that we have the number, what's the next thing that needs to happen? So I'm just going to write DES right next to this so we know that's a piece of memory. So step three. And this has to happen in order. We can't do step two without asking a question, correct? So we have a number. Somebody give me a number. You're my users. Seven. So DEC equals seven. What do we do with that then? Well, the, the program has a single purpose right now. That is to take a decimal number and convert it into binary. So it's implied that once they get that decimal number, the next thing it should be doing is converting. How do we do that? How do we take seven decimal and put it into binary? What was the way I taught you guys? Divide by two, right? Let's do that. So we take the number, which was 7, and we divide by 2. So let's make that generic. Divide whatever the number is, decimal, right, by 2. So far, pretty simple. What's wrong? Is this what you guys did when we learned how to convert it? Josh, what did we do? All right, so there is no three and a half because seven divided by two is three and a half, correct? But rather, we need to capture the remainder. It's three remainder. So maybe what we need to do in here is is that how you spell remainder? <laughs> I have a lot of confidence in that one. But you guys get the idea. What's that? All right. What's the next thing? Is that what we did? What's that? The three. Where'd that three come from? Maybe what we also need to do 
is capture the co uh, the quotient. So, is that how you spell quotient? No. T I E N T. There's no A. Are you sure this is not an A? Q U O T I. Thank you, guys. All right, so we need to capture quotient. So in other words, how about Q equals that? We all right with that? Because what this will allow me to do is now I get to take 2 and divide it by Q. Correct? Because doesn't this always change? What do we call something that always changes? It varies, hence it's a variable. All right. So in this case right now, Q equals 3. So Q divided by 2 gives me what for the quotient? 1. And then R is going to be equal to? Hmm. So step 6, divide Q quotient by... Two. Step seven, capture quotient, right? Step eight, capture remainder. Did I reach the end yet? So, divide Q by 2, what do I get? Hmm. Step 9, divide Q Step 10, capture Q. Step 11, capture R. Am I done yet? What's that? Ah, oh, okay. So I'm done with the vision. So how does the computer know they're done with the vision? A condition, right? A condition has to be met. And as Morgan was telling me, that if Q equals zero, then what? Then stop? When do you ask when Q equals zero? Every third time? Every fourth time? Every time. Oops. I guess... I should be asking it here, 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 but there's something wrong with this. What if this number was 97? Do you think I'm only going to be dividing three times? So what do I have to do? Build a million steps just in case the number is a million? When we are in California, we don't build fixed buildings. We make them flex so that when there's an earthquake, the building has a greater chance of surviving, correct? When we write code, we don't build it as so it's only this particular case. It needs to be flexible. There's got to be conditions to be met, correct? Do you see that this stuff was repeating over and over and over? Huh. Computer programmers are one of the laziest people you guys will ever meet. Let me show you how lazy they are. This was frivolous. We're adapting our program. I know you guys wrote it down, and that's good. But here's what we're going to be doing now. First thing is, we're taking deaths and we're dividing it by two. 
haven't we been always taking a particular number and always dividing it by two? Correct? Do I need a Q? If I started off with taking death divided by two, can I always make this death all the way down through? I'm making the code more efficient. Why am I making it more efficient? Prior to that point, I need two boxes of storage, correct? Now, I just need a single box. That means my program takes less memory. What does that mean to total performance when it comes to your computer? It's going to be better, correct? OK. So desk now equals these things. I like that. After we divided that, we had to capture R. Right? We needed the remainder. R is going to be a little tricky. We're going to explore R right now, actually. Let's look down through here. This was a bad example to illustrate what I want to talk about because they're all ones, correct? When we get done with this, what the answer should be is one, 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 correct? But think about how this happens. You gave me a number, it was seven, correct? I put a seven in this box. First step, divide the seven by two, capture R. What does R equal? One, right? Repeat. If and only if, we call it death, is not equal to zero, correct? That is, if you don't have a zero here, repeat. Isn't that what we've talked about? Keep on dividing until you get a zero for the quotient. So there's your loop, and that's what they're called. They're called loop statements. So if this condition is true, jump back up here and divide. What's des equal to now? Whoops. Des is still equal to 7. So raise that step. Would it be better to do this right here? Des equals the results of what's in there right now. How would this look then? If this was a math problem, if you guys had to do this like in an algebra class, what would this be equal to? Remember your order of operations? How does this execute? Would it look something like this? Well, that doesn't make sense, does it? Seven does not equal three and a half, correct? Order of operations, when it comes to programming, this thing is called an assignment operator. That means whatever work is done here gets done first, then it gets stored here. We good about that? Right now, des equals seven, correct? Seven divided by two is going to give me, we're gonna cut off the decimal, the, uh, sorry, the fraction, if you will. We good about that? This comes important because right here, I can do that loop if des does not equal zero, jump back up to the beginning. Let's see how this works. And this is why we're not coding yet. We're just trying to break it down to see if this functions. There's more than one way to accomplish this task. First time we ask the question, the person puts a seven in this box. This box, we don't know what's filled with. Go to step three. Take seven, divide it by two. How did I know there's seven? I look what's in this box. Replace that box with the answer. Replace it with three. We good there? Capture the remainder. The remainder becomes one. Is that okay? Does DEC not equal to zero? Is that true? What is DCE now? Three. Three does not equal zero. What do I do next? 
Go back to number three. Take whatever DC is, DCE, and divide it by two. What's the answer? Put it inside that box. All right. Capture the remainder. What is the remainder? Erase what's in this box. Now, it did change. I destroyed what was in the box, and I put it back with another one, correct? Does three, sorry, does one not equal to uh, zero? True, what do I do next? One divided by two is, rounding down, gives me. Capture the remainder, the remainder was a one, right? Does zero not equal zero? Does that make sense? Zero is zero, correct? So this is false. Go to step six. What is step six? Print the results. Print the remainder. But wait a minute, that's not what the results are. What are the results? Start at the bottom, and you string these together, correct? What's in R right now? It's only the last value. So it's going to print out R, which is going to come right to 1. And trust me, 7 in decimal is not 1 in binary, correct? So what happened? What went wrong with our program? What's the flaw or the bug in our program? I'm constantly replacing what's in this box with the last remainder, correct? It's not accumulating the remainders. How might you guys make a suggestion to fix that? Should I call this one R1, R2, R3? That would do this, right? Tell me what's the flaw with that logic, because it would work. Yeah, it's not flexible. It will crash because it goes outside what our program is capable of doing. So we got to add a new feature. We call these arrays. Why can't we take this box and make tiny departments in them? The apartment is called, I don't know, give me an apartment building in town. Does anybody know one? An apartment complex in town in Corning or in Elmira? Colonial Manor. Colonial Manor. All right, so the name of the apartment is called Colonial Manor. <laughs> I don't even know if that exists, but thanks for telling me. <laughs> but there's going to be apartment zero, apartment one, apartment two, apartment three, correct? And everybody has their own people living them, their own family, their own furniture, their own art on the wall, correct? Their own space. But I just mentioned it as Colonial Manor. We good there? So this is the remainder box. And this box can be divided up whatever different size, as many remainders as we need. We good there? So I have to keep what we call an index, which is beyond the scope of this class. And the index is just a marker to where the next box is available. Does that make sense? We call them counters. So let's do that. Let's modify the code. Uh, let's do a, a step in here. We'll call that define variables. And the way we're going to define this is going to be, uh, let's call it IDX equals zero, okay? Saying the first apartment's available. You good with that, guys? Starting over from the beginning, ask the person for a number. We said seven. Seven gets stored here. Good. Number three, take seven, divide it by two, and store it back in that same box. That's a three. Capture R. 
capture R and store it in R index. What's index right now? Oh, I need a new box, by the way, because I defined this variable, correct? New box of memory. So R is, uh, index is zero. So we're up at this stop. That means in this very first box, I put a one, correct? Does des equal, or not equal to three, or zero? Is des not equal to zero? True, what do I do? Go back up to three? Index equals index plus one. Before I go back to the beginning, look what will happen. If I don't change that zero to the next available slot, I'm gonna be in that same problem again, correct? That I constantly replace this first number. So now I go to step six, which is going to be if uh, DEC is not equal to zero, then go back to three. All I'm doing is moving the pointer. You good there? Let's see it in action. Three divided by two gives me one. Remember, we're rounding down, correct? Round down. Capture R and store it where? Remember, index now equals one, correct? So now we put the one in here. Now we're here. Does des not equal to zero? True. Come back here. Oops, I forgot to bump the counter. Now does one not equal zero? Come back up here. One divided by two gives me, round down. Capture R, we're in box two now, which is going to be one, correct? Bump the counter. Does zero not equal zero? False. What do we do now? We go to step seven. What's step seven, folks? When we get done here, what is step seven? Print what? So print the results. What is the result going to equal? But you need to give it to me like in a formula because these will vary, right, according to the results. Print R IDX, but there's a problem, right? It's got to go with the last one and it's got to work its way down, correct? Well, right now, IDX equals three. What's in box three? Nothing, it's garbage. So how about print R IDX minus one, right? Because it's the last box. We good there? And what happens if we put this in a loop? And when do we stop? because we don't deal with negative numbers, right? Then what it'll do is just keep on printing these out. One, 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 now it's equal zero, stop. Step eight, end. Or, if you want your program to run forever, go back to number one. Ask them for the next question, the next number, right? Depends on what your purpose is. If you want them to convert a bunch of numbers like your calculator, it goes on and on and on for an infinite loop. When does it stop? When you hit the little X button, right? And you know what the little X button does? It sets a variable to negative one. And it says if I don't know, let's just say DEC equals negative one, stop, 
right? Conditional statements. Conditional statements change the course of the program. Instead of going down this path, it now has to go down this path. That helps us teach the computer logic. Think about it. Condition, logic. Do this if this case is true. That's all logic. What have we done so far? Some math and some logic. Tell me, have we heard that before? What part of the CPU handles this? The rhythmic logic unit. When you write code, you have to write it to the processor, and all processors have to handle division and logic, because all processors have ALUs. So when you develop code, it has to be compiled so it can run on a particular platform. So that the CPU knows that this binary code is division. How does it know that those zeros and ones represent division? Because your compiler knows what the processor is, and it converts this stuff that we did into the language that that processor understands. This is why when you guys go shopping for software, it'll say something along the lines of system requirements must run on an Intel processor. Will not work on an, Apple's compu an Apple computer because all of them require different instruction sets. So now, what was the hardest part about this? <laughs> Of course. Like I said, I'm not going to make you guys programmers in a one and a half hour class. Was the division that hard? Okay. Was even like a little if statement that hard? What made it so hard was the fact that we took these components, these statements, organized them in such a way that they'll always produce predictable results. Because order affected the outcome, correct? If I didn't ask this question here, how does the software or the operating system know to go back up to this question or this step? What if I asked it right up here and not down there? What would have been the outcome? So in the video that we watched, Bill Gates said all you need to do is know some addition, maybe some division. He's right. The act of programming or knowing a programming language isn't that challenging. What is challenging is to take something that we could do naturally and teach it into something that the computer understands. What makes this awesome compared to this? Let's change the two so it's B. Why would I change the two with a B? And let me add a question in here that says, ask for the base. And let me replace the two over here with a B. That's the only spot that I have to do it with. Here's a box. Could I convert this same number into another system like Octo. Now, would it, the same rules apply? If b equals 8, 7 divided by 8 is a 0, remainder 7. What's the base for octo? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, correct? Is 7 in its base? Let's try a different number. Let's try 16. Right, 16 divided by 8 is 2 remainder 0. Go to the next step. 2 divided by 8 is 0 remainder 2. In this case, all I needed was two steps. My result is going to be to zero. It looks like we created a program that can take any decimal number and convert it to any base. 
formulas make life flexible. Don't memorize something. I've told you guys this back in the beginning of the semester. Understand it. By understanding it, look at what we gained by going from number system to number system. More importantly, I know you guys aren't computer scientists, but tell me, how is this going to benefit your life? Once again, raise your hand if you're a business student. How is this going to benefit you as a business student? What are you guys trying to achieve by being or with a business degree? What is your end game? Why did you come to school to get a business degree? One day I'm going to grow up and be what? Fill in that blank. Rich. <laughs> okay. How are you going to get rich? Solving problems. Okay. <laughs> Give me the job title that you are inspiring to be. Okay, so you want to be an accountant. Well, then you fit right in here because those people are anal and they stick to structure like you wouldn't believe. Correct? This was a faster. And that's what we're thinking. You know, that's why we have programmers because I just want to use the program. But that's not what we're talking about here. What we are talking about is that most of you are going to be managers. And what do you think your job is as a manager? Your job is to make sure that people are doing their job. Now, how are they doing their job and how effective are they at doing their job? It all depends on how effective you are in giving them instructions. Managers are getting lazier and lazier because they throw at the interview or the job qualification that they must have a four-year degree, right? It was never like that in the past. If they wanted you bad enough, they would say on-job training is available, correct? In fact, you'd be in this for so long that you became the master of your subject. We had lifers. The old generation would work for the company from the day that they were born, quote-unquote, until the day that they died. They developed their job description, if you were, if you will. And then they were responsible for training the next person on. Managers say, well, if you got a MBA, you should be qualified in doing this, and I shouldn't have to spend any time teaching you how to apply those skills to this actual job. Leave me alone, go off and do your work because you say you're qualified. I shouldn't be holding your hand. Is that effective management? Now, is effective management being right up their ass and controlling them like puppets? I would quit the next day. I feel too uncomfortable. So how do you take something like this and apply it to management? First of all, you don't treat people like machines. Different, sorry, the same input, the same treatment, by definition, when it comes to humans, will produce various outputs. One day they woke up and they were just so happy because the sun was shining in, in their bedroom window and it just made them all feel light and fluffy for the day. You can tell them the world's coming to an end and they're all positive. Next day they woke up and they got a Power Ranger where the sun doesn't shine and now they're crabby. <laughs> you tell them the same thing, you're going to get a different result. So how do you do it? Fact is, as your manager, you're going to be processing this and be like, you know, I do have to talk to so-and-so. The job production isn't where it should be. How am I going to approach this? And you need to follow some kind of systematic approach because with today's society, we're always suing people for a hot cup of coffee. So you're following that line of how do I coordinate what I know I want to get across to this person so that they understand it. It's not going to be if they're in a mood, then go to step three and follow this to step four. Uh, yeah, I don't even know what that is. I think we got a tiny little leprechaun. He's happy because... <laughs> Those are my meals. 
That's where I was going with it. Thank you. A programming language is just a set of guidelines, a syntax, a grammar that programmers follow. But what they create produces various purposes, have various roles. So as Adam mentioned, this reminds them of SOP, Standard Operating Protocols. What are protocols? A set of rules to follow. What is a programming language? Oh, sorry, what is a program? A set of instructions that the operating system and the CPU follows to execute or to complete a task. What are employees? They're your workers, exactly. I was going to fill a word with a B, but I think it's inappropriate. But in any case, they are your workers. They're like the CPU. You have to feed them not only the materials, but the instructions on how you want this to be accomplished. If you give vague instructions, expect poor output. If you are not flexible and accommodating and treat people with respect, once again, expect poor output. This allows you, as a programmer, to be very methodical, to think before you talk, to analyze things thoroughly. I've made a few mistakes through this process. Did I throw it out there and say, buy this program for 10 bucks? I looked at it and did it over and over, optimized it until I got the results that I want. How do you do that as a manager? That's your fine line. That's your language. That's your department. Hopefully you acquire enough experience. Notice I didn't say courses, because that's a bunch of joke. So what you know about, what's it, Mize, Mize, Mizo? Is that the hierarchical needs? Maslow. Maslow, thank you. See, I don't know the guy. I'm not a business person. Maybe that would benefit you that you guys know those seven needs. Are there seven needs? Six needs? Yeah, seven. Yeah, all right, good. Those lucky numbers. We've been using that all day. All right, whip de do. How do you take that and using your experience and apply it to handle your employees? Nobody can teach you that. I can't teach you that. I know I definitely can't teach you that. But I think some of our great business instructors on this campus can't teach you that. They can tell you stories. They can tell you how they handled the circumstance where they were in. But trust me, everybody's different. They can't just copy and paste that experience onto the, your employees. But what I'd recommend you guys doing is thinking. Use this damn thing. It's like everybody's afraid of using it. It's too much work to think. Just go to Google. You guys learn quite a bit. I don't even care if you guys know how to program as much as why you have a college education. A college education is forcing you guys to use this thing up here, exercise the hell out of it, to apply logic. You see what we accomplished? And I think it's amazing that we were able to take switches, flipping them on and off to get this computer to do something that we do naturally, which we call math. Folks, we're talking about electricity. Put your finger in an outlet. That thing that just shocked you on your ass has performed a level of intelligence. You guys are fascinated when you hear a parrot cite poetry. You're fascinated when you see a chimp grab a rock and use it as a tool. To me, they have a brain. It should be expected. Electricity. Is it organic? Does it live, breathe, consume, digest? No. It's just a bunch of electrons moving through a circuit or through a wire, and we manipulated them to allow us to play movies, to become intelligent, 
to tell us in the future, you need to fire so-and-so because their results are producing or, or poor results or whatever. They're producing poor results. So let's do this. Let's install some software, and let's actually see this in action, and let's be impressed. Did that just time out on me? There we go. So I need you guys to do me a favor, uh, hopefully. Have you guys already signed into uh, the administrative account? Everybody's at the desktop is what I should be saying? Good. All right, uh, open up Windows Explorer. You went off. Okay, so I'll sign you in. When you guys get to Windows Explorer, um, in the address bar, type in the following. It's going to be two backslashes, a capital letter P, lowercase ub, backslash public. There is going to be a folder in there called software. Double click on that folder called software. Inside that folder is going to be an installation file called small basic. All right, so in the address bar where it says libraries, uh, type in backslash backslash public backslash, sorry, pub backslash public. Inside that folder, there should be another folder called software. All right. Double click on the software folder and double click on the small basic installation file. All right, you guys know how to install software, so go through the wizard. Agree, hit next. Uh, where it says everybody, just put a dot next to check me, uh, sorry, just me, and if you've already done it, don't worry, it's no big deal. Is everybody able to install this? If all goes well, it should say successfully installed. Hit close to exit out of there. Click on your start button. Let's click on all programs, scroll down, and uh, hopefully there's a folder called something, Small Basic. Click on Microsoft Small Basic. All right, this is important. This little single quote means that the following thing that you're about to type in, which please do, is going to be considered a comment. The nice thing about an IDE like Small Basic is they do color coding indentations for you to let you know what are the different components of a programming language. The green, anything that's in green, is always going to be considered a comment. By default, a comment is something that's ignored by the compiler. Hit enter. One line, one statement, okay folks? Don't try to write multiple statements in a single line. It's read from top down until you get to oh, sorry, conditional statements. So let's get to the next one. We called it IDX equals zero. Bless you. This is called the declaration as well as the initialization. I am declaring a variable and I'm calling it IDX. I'm initializing this variable to start at zero. Why did I decide to make IDX start at zero? Because our first box in our array is box zero, correct? Isn't that where we use the IDX? Okay, let's hit enter. And I have Q this time instead of calling it decimal. So Q space equals space zero. Now this is sort of trivial to put this in here because in a minute I'm going to ask a question and I'm going to store it, whatever the user put in there, into Q. But it's just good practicing habits so that when you see it, this area up here is declaring space and we're initializing the space with something that's predictable. All right, so we put Q equals zero. Let's hit enter. We're going to do the same thing with base. Now I just got Q here, base, B, either or. All I'm doing is asking the operating system for some space on memory. That's it. I will reference them as IDX Q base. 
The operating system will represent them as a bunch of zeros and ones in binary, okay? Let's hit enter. Hit enter again. It's okay to leave a line empty. I like doing it because it breaks off my regions, variables. Now the next thing is gonna be called a subroutine. Let's start with the comment. Enter what, a decimal number? And a base, uh, no, let's get, yeah, let's get rid of and a base, just say enter a decimal number. All right, once you do that, hit enter and type in sub, get DEC, hit enter. Notice this time after you type in sub, get DEC and hit enter, did it automatically indent your insertion point? So everybody should be on line eight. I didn't explain the idea of a subroutine. Remember that set of code that was repeating over and over? They fall into loops, which you guys will see in a second. But sometimes there are codes that get reused from time to time that you don't want to loop through it, but you might want to call upon it here and there. Case in point, no matter what program you guys are in, you go up the file and you choose save as. Do you get the same dialog box each time? Do you think a million programmers have redeveloped that save as dialog box? One person dissolved it, people liked it, they started using it over and over and over. That's what functions and subroutines allow us to do. In fact, we call them methods inside objects, okay? So let's do this one. Text window. Do you notice when I start typing in text window, I have this little autocomplete box drop down from us? Text window is an object. Technically, when you write a program, you really have to write everything from scratch. That means you have to grow the chicken, collect the eggs. You have to grow the wheat, collect the wheat, grind the wheat, right? Do we do that anymore when we go to bake a cake? No, we have farmers do that for us. Likewise, we had other programmers develop this object called a text window that allows us to ask our users for input or send out output which thank you for that, because if I had to develop this, it would take me another month doing just that. Yeah? So let's put a dot there. Like I said, objects are designed to represent something. This particular object's gonna represent a command line interface. Remember that was one of our user interfaces? After all, folks, if we're asking the user for input and we're gonna send out information as an output, Remember the model, you interact with the operating system. How do you interact with the operating system? Through a user interface, right? Graphical or command line. Text window gives me a command line interface. This window is gonna have a property or a function that's gonna allow me to send text to it. Let's type in write. This method is designed to prompt the user with output. In other words, whatever I put inside this parenthesis, make sure you guys put the quotations in there, the user gets to see, enter a decimal number. Now, I would recommend that you guys take some mental note at the end of the semester, I promise to show you how this is gonna be very practical for business people using Microsoft Office. Have you guys ever opened up a file like in Excel or PowerPoint or maybe even Word that said, do you wanna disable macros or enable macros? Microsoft Office uses a program called VBA, which is Visual Basic for Applications. This is basic. What have we learned about programming? If it's a repetitive task, a machine can do it, correct? Have you ever done something over and over and over, whether it's in Word, Excel, or PowerPoint, and you wish you can hit a couple keystrokes and it'll do it each time? Well, if you know how to program, you can do that. So at the end of the semester, I will show you guys that and how this will make it really helpful for you because if you guys become that salary employee that's making a lot of money, the sooner you get your work done, the sooner you're out, right? So, we prompt the user with please enter a decimal number. We hit enter. 
And now what are we going to do? Q equals text window dot read. I put read in there, but you also see read number. What do you think the difference between these two methods are? Look at your keyboard. If I prompt my user to please enter in a number, does it prevent them from entering in a letter? It's like when I ask you guys, could you please write your name or in your documents? You know, when you guys submit your labs, and it always says CSIT 1390 underneath it, student name. Either it just says student name, or it says your name, but it doesn't actually say your actual name. I can't stop you guys from actually putting in your real name. I asked you to do it in the instructions, and I'm hoping you follow instructions, but that's sort of out of my control. If I just put in read here, I'm allowing my user to enter in anything. Please tell me, what's apple divided by two? Half an apple, there we go. But I don't get binary from that, correct? So maybe I should force my user to type in a number by saying read number. So do that. This way, if the user tries typing in the letter A, it'll deny them. Make your program idiot proof. That's how you do it. Because if you get the results of Apple divided by two, your program will crash. Because it's like, how the hell do I divide that? All right, let's hit enter. And let's type in n sub. Before I type in n sub, I'm going to hit the backspace, so I'm back near the 10. Now, of course, we can manually go through this, but as a programmer, you should only write a block of code and test that block of code. So let's test this block of code. The way we're going to do it is we're going to hit enter. And we are going to, I'm going to hit enter again to give me an extra space. I'm going to type in if, as you guys can see, q is less than 1, then hit enter, get des. Over there we follow the top-down approach. We said 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And we like that, that it's going that way. However, the way I wrote this code doesn't necessarily follow the top-down approach. The only time this code is ever executed is when you tell the operating system to go get that code. How do you tell the operating system to go get that code? On line 13, when you typed in get des, that's the command that's telling the operating system to go get the code that represents get des. That's these two lines right here. So the way this program is going to be executed, we initialize these variables, we jump over this, and then we ask ourselves, does Q, is Q less than one? What is Q right now? Zero. Q is zero. Is zero less than one? Then we execute this line. What is this line going to do? It's going to start right up here. Now the user is going to be prompt. Enter a decimal number. Next thing is going to happen is whatever you put in there, it goes into Q right? We get out of the sub and we go back to this statement. Does Q equal or is Q less than 1? I don't know what Q is. I just hope the user put a non-zero number in, correct? Now we go back to the end of this and we're just going to find out by typing in text window, hit enter so you're on line 16, text window dot write line, if you will, sorry, right line, left parenthesis, and type in Q. And right now, the only thing this program is going to do is it's going to take whatever's in Q and print it out. So we get to see what's in Q. It's like an echo. If you type in something, it's just going to spit it right back. Let's run this. Before we run it, let's click save or save as. I'm going to call this des2 
base, meaning any base, if you will. You guys can call it whatever you want. Just give it a name, click Save. And when you get done saving it, come up here and click Run. When you click Run, our IDE is going to automatically compile that high-level language into something that the machine can understand. Did you guys get a little DOS screen, if you will, a black text window? And they're asking you to enter in a number. Try typing in Apple. Ha. Ah. Idiot proof, right? And it was really cool because I didn't have to write the code to check for every letter. I just used that function that said numbers, right? Read number. All right, let me put in 10 and let me hit enter. And did it spit back 10 back to you guys? Yeah, I know it's nothing fancy. You're not creating the next word processor here or the next web browser. But the thing is, is this is all electricity being manipulated. Let's press any key. It's any key, literally. Now, what I'm going to give you guys a chance is on Blackboard, I will be posting an extra credit assignment. And all it is is monkey see, monkey do. You finish the rest of this program. Okay? But that requires that you download and install Small Basic on your home computer. And in the extra credit assignment, I will upload Small Basic as an attached file. Okay? But there's only one caveat to get the five points of extra credit. Now, we're not talking percentage points here. This course is like a thousand points, if I remember correctly. So, five points out of a thousand, or whatever the final total becomes might be a half a percentage or whatever the case may be, but the point that I'm just trying to let you guys know is you're getting rewarded for doing something that's not quite testable. I'm not going to ask you guys on your exam to write this code out, but I will ask you maybe what a variable is. I will ask you what a compiler does. Maybe I'll ask you what the generations of languages are and how they're different. But like I'm trying to get to you guys, I want you guys to start understanding how to think, if you will. After all, think about what we did here today. Did you see a correlation between software and hardware? Did we see how the ALU is now being functioned by writing some code that does some math? Is it still going to be math when we try to do something more advanced like editing photos? Yes, it's always math. Will it require a high level math? Absolutely. This is just simple math. It's a simple program. What else have you acquired from today's exercise? <laughs> no, not really. I can't make a better manager. <laughs> I hope that you'll eventually acquire this concept of looking at a complex problem, dissecting it until it's elementary components. After all, we love eating cake or ice cream. Some people enjoy making it. So what do we do to make the process easier for the people that make it? You create a recipe. Recipe up top declares how much of something, correct? Recipe up top declare their variables. Instructions down below tells you what to do with those ingredients to get the results. A recipe should give you guys predictable behaviors. As managers, if you want your employees to do something, maybe you need to learn how they function, what makes them better employees, and try to produce a product or instructions that make that behavior occur more often. <laughs>